Good morning, everybody out there in COT land. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Angela, good to see you here. You're early, early bird this morning. Good to see you, Paula. Good to see you, Lisa. Who do we have in there? Butterfly, good to see you, Don. Lisa is in the house. Patty Cakes, good to see you. Good to see you. Good to, you, you guys know who I miss? Dr. V. Dr. V. You know, I woke up praying for Dr. V this morning. I did. I surely did. I surely did. <clears throat> you guys keep Dr. V in your prayers, too. Keep his household in your prayers. Serge, good to see you. Haven't seen you in a long time. God bless you, brother. God bless you, Denise. Good to see you. Folks, we're going to study, I believe it's chapter 99 in the book of Enoch. In the book of Enoch. I, I, I tell you what, gentlemen, gentlemen. There's nothing more precious, at least to me, than to hear our counterpart lift up the name of the Lord, to recognize him as being king, him as being the most high. There is nothing more precious than to see our counterparts, our female counterparts, lifting up the name of the Lord. I think that is incredibly precious. That is absolutely 100% precious, and it is right. I think it's awesome. I think it's awesome. Pearl says, what's wrong with Dr. V? Well, we haven't, um, haven't heard from Dr. V in a little while, right? And so um, just keep him in your prayers, right? Haven't heard from him. We just miss him. We can miss people and then pray for him. Never go into a panic in prayer. Because he's always in the Father's hands like we are. No need for you to panic over me either. No need for any of us to panic over one another. Because the Most High has us in his hands. Right? The Most High has us. But we just missed Dr. V. Haven't seen him in a while. Right? So keep me in your prayers. When I don't see somebody for a while, I do petition, Lord, let me know. Everything is all right with him. Let me know. That's all I want to know. Lord, give me some understanding. Let me know. They're okay. And then I'm fine. I'm fine. But they're in the Lord's hands. They truly are. We're going to study chapter 99 in the book of Enoch. I believe it's chapter 99. I'm going to pop a link in the chat room. You guys want to hear something funny. Um, now, you may or may not know this, but I'm just now, just now getting back to the place where I can, um, I can actually interact with you guys again. And begin to do things on the site. And prior, like right now, today is going to be our absolute last day doing the Book of Enoch from any online uh, resources. The rest are going to be in-house COT resources. But don't you know that um, the one week we were set up to do the Book of Enoch, that entire site disappeared. It was there all week long except for Friday. And then it did it another Friday vanished, disappeared. And now we have problems with three of our outbound streams. Nobody else through these services, and they're all American services. The overseas systems work fine, but not the American systems. I'll give you another piece of news. Do you guys know that Mike Pence's plane ran off the runway last night? Do you guys know that? He's okay. Nobody was hurt, right? Somebody brought that to my attention as it was happening. They heard the call over the ATC, and they, they pointed my attention to that, right, because it kind of flagged a few things when it was happening. When it, there was a problem before they were landing. There was a problem before they were landing. And so it was flagged. But listen, on the side of the plane said, Make America Great Again, and it ran off the runway. If that's not a sign for something, oh, what's going to get people's attention? Now, understand what I'm saying, and I don't, listen, I do not believe in things just happening. Certainly when they're televised, these things are on purpose. The Most High is communicating something to all of his children. Listen to what I'm saying. The jet that was carrying Mike Pence on the side of that jet said, Make America Great Again. And the plane ran off the runway. Do you guys understand that? 
let me tell you what let me tell you what's in my heart what's been in my heart for a long time unlike most people I am deeply always deeply concerned about my fellow man always deeply concerned about my fellow man you see I understand that the country is nothing absent her people right the country is just soil and stuff that's it listen to me close because some people don't even think this way they don't think the way I'm about to explain it the country is nothing more than buildings and stuff and dirt and creations and idols that's what the country is that's nothing the people are the important aspect and the people are truly the country not the stuff but the people have rejected Jesus of Nazareth and have adopted all sorts of wickedness they have legalized the abominations of God you guys know those scriptures where the Lord was talking about abominations and those things he hates hmm? they have legalized these things the people as a whole are not going to reach a point of greatness but their achievements are going to be derailed it's going to it's running off the runway because the people have rebelled against the Lord remember this the country are the people it, let me tell you what's happening people are ready to fight one another to save the stuff that's a delusion how can you fight one another when each and every individual in the country constitutes the country why would you fight a person in the country when they constitute the country no that's not what they're doing they're fighting for stuff you know what they're fighting on behalf of their written ideologies and there are many of them in America my goodness and they have run off the rails all by themselves they're not thinking soberly this is why they fight it's also why wickedness and iniquity will rise that's why and that's something and that's it's so strange they're rejecting the voice of the people and they're serving idols again this time we live in is no different than the times of old no different and do you know what bought down every single country the people did here's the process of a nation at the end the leaders of that nation become so incredibly powerful that they really do think they have the best answer and the people don't agree with those in the power element so when the people rebel as a whole they topple governments countries fall happens every single time that's what's happening right now before your eyes the people think they know what they want but they're never going to get it and when they find out this time this time right now when they find out that whoever the leader is, the, the leader right now is marked, the people will rebel. Changes will be made. You live in a time like no other. You guys, the ones who were born, drawn to the book of Revelation. There's a reason for that. In no other time in history was an entire generation drawn to the book of Revelation. No other generation. You see, you put up with things people of old couldn't put up with. There are devils on every side of you, temptations all around you. I submit to you right now, people of old could not endure the simple temptations you have in your life. They would think this is a world of magic. They would think a computer should be worshipped. You live in a generation of man-made idols and things of that nature and you're overcoming them the reason why you can't see it that way is because you were born into it but if all this technology was found it, that's why people don't believe they ever reached a point of this society a long time ago it's impossible to believe in a like manner for those who lived back then right back in the time of Christ it would be impossible for them to believe that we have the technology we do today I mean, for goodness sake, 
It was a bishop that said no one will ever go to the moon. It was also a bishop that said if man were meant to fly, God would have gave them wings, and that was reserved for the angels. And that bishop was the father of the Wright brothers. Men speaking out of their own spirits and not speaking truth, speaking what they think is right. They've been doing that for a long time. All the wise people got together. They got together, and you know what they said? There are no such thing as meteors coming to hit the earth. All of it are rocks struck by lightning. That's what they said. All the wise and the scientific individuals, why? Because they do what they do based upon the time that they live in. They can only draw upon what they can see, and that is the failure in science. They draw upon what they see. They've been wrong every single time. Every time they say something can't happen, it ends up happening. When all the experts come to a consensus and say, this will never be, it always is. Yet mankind, they put their trust in the advice of science, and they're running their society based upon trending. Computations. Who's running the country? Algorithms are running the country. There is no leader that ever makes a decision absent trending data and advisement from computers. Even their advisors are gathering information from a computer. You see how that works. So who is the life source of all governments right now? Algorithms. They're running computations. They have become dependent upon computers. And computers are running alg algorithms to advise them on what they should do. They're taking orders from a computer. And they're becoming confident about the computer. You don't think we have stepped in and have been born in a type of strong delusion? The difference between the world and us is this. And you have to read this because some people say, well, why can't they see? Because God already declared this. God will give them over to a strong delusion that they would believe a lie. All those who don't love the truth will be given over to a strong delusion. See, to love the truth is to be worthy of it. To not love the truth, you'll never pursue it. You'll never keep it with you. You will abandon it, backstab it, and everything else. And God will send those people over. He will send them a strong delusion so they'll be stuck. I'll tell you what, if God sends a delusion to someone, they're not coming out. And guess why he sends them a strong delusion? That they all might be damned. Why is that? Because he's so full of grace and mercy. He's so full of grace and mercy. He so loves us that he does not want us to perish outside of him. And to send them to a strong delusion that they would believe a lie will cause them to be anger, cause them to be uh, condemned in his own eyesight. If a righteous person were sent a delusion, they would still pursue truth. God has such love for his creation that he's going to send them a strong delusion that they kindle. They will utterly kindle his wrath against them. Since they don't want to see, they're going to be blinded. Because they don't want to hear, they're going to be deaf. And they will only hear those things of flesh effectively cut off from the spirit. They will believe in fables and everything else. God is doing this. He will do this. They're not going to come back so that they all might be damned who loved not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now we're going to talk about a little unrighteousness and righteousness today in the book of Enoch. We're going to examine ourselves because Enoch in chapter 99, that's X-C-I-X. That's Roman numeral for 99, I believe, if my brain is working right. You all see what the Lord is. You know what? It's, 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 um, it's very bitter to know that the Lord is doing this at the final time. Very bitter. But it is sweet. It was sweet to us to know that, yes, the Lord is coming. Yes, his prophecies are going to be fulfilled. But then you see the process, and it's breaking your heart because those people close to you cannot see nor hear 
the creator. Some of those folks you have petitioned for, and they walked away anyway. Some of the folks that are going to be cast away, that could be your own child. That could be your spouse. You don't know who it is. You really don't know. Each individual has a choice to make. But I tell you this, if you so much as partly condemn them, you're the one that's going to be thrown in the delusion. To wrongfully judge is unrighteousness. And if you take pleasure in judging others, which means you practice that thing a lot, and you get satisfaction out of it, you have pleasure in unrighteousness. If you so much as make a tiny error in your judgment, that's unrighteousness. And if it yields to you a satisfaction that you think you have said the truth on someone, but it's an error in that truth. You just had pleasure in unrighteousness. My goodness. Did you ever think of it that way? And just how many times have we been absolutely perfectly right in our judgments? Even the unspoken judgments we have towards another. Even the contempt we hold within ourselves for somebody else. Hmm? How many times has your judgment been perfect? Do you think God takes pleasure in judgment? No, he does not. Not right now because we're under grace and mercy. But when his wrath comes, grace and mercy is gone. This is the time of grace and mercy, that all men have a chance. But if you have so much as made the tiny, most minute error in your judgment, it's unrighteousness. And if you had satisfaction from the judgment you placed upon another, you had pleasure in unrighteousness. I thank God for things like that. You know why? Who would contemplate such a thing? That, ladies and gentlemen, is knowledge from above which is easily entreated. It's kind. It's a whopper fact to know, but it's still kind easily to be entreated. It gives us recognition. It gives us a oops moment. It's easily understood. Your flesh may fight it, but it's easily understood. But I tell you what, you apply that principle, you're going to keep the, your, the lips closed a little bit. I, I'll tell you the truth. I don't want to be wrong in error, so I withhold my tongue from judgment. I withhold my tongue from judgment because in order to judge, you have to see all. In order for you to judge, you have to judge with righteous balances, or you judge unrighteously. My goodness, the smallest error, and you doom yourself. And with that same measure of judgment, you're going to be judged. Some people have lives of perpetual torment. Why? Because they have judgmental hearts. They don't know that they've been living every day of their life under somebody else's judgment. But I can tell you this, the one in the earth who is merciful to all people, they receive mercy all the time. See, those principles of Christ are so true, so real. I have to live my life by them. And I know when I'm making a mistake, I never do anything that I don't know about. I know when I mess up. It's premeditated mess ups. The Holy Spirit will tell me, don't, 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 don't. don't. I'll do it anyway. And the hammer drops. That's why I never complain. Anything bad that comes my way, I'll look back in my life and say, yep, I saw that one day. See, I was thinking that you're getting to a point now that if thoughts manifest in your mind and you begin to agree with those thoughts, that it enters into your heart. And here's how a thought enters into your heart. It moves you emotionally. How many of you know that? That's a mystery to some. They say, well, how does a thought enter into the heart? You're moved emotionally. Thus you keep it. 
<clears throat> See, a thought that comes into your head and you cast it out does not move you emotionally. In order for something to go into the heart, you contemplate that thought and you are moved emotionally. When that happens, it stays in your heart and is tied to emotion. When something is tied to emotion, you keep it. And when that happens, it truly has entered into the heart and it will come out in action. That's how thoughts enter into the heart. Now, it was told to us, take captive your thoughts. When something enters into your mind, you better, you better compare that to righteousness. And I can assure you that most of your thoughts you will pluck out of your life. You will forbid them from entering into your heart. You'll forbid them. Thus your heart will be cleansed. But if you entertain all thoughts, or you sit up thinking all day and many things enter into the heart, you'll end up double-minded, unstable in all your ways, speaking vile things. You'll have the can't help it. I've known people that can't help but to curse. And they say, oh, Lord, please help me. I don't want to curse. Five minutes later, they start cursing about something. Why? Because those things have entered into the heart. Right? That is something. These things are so obvious. The book of Enoch 99. You guys ready for this? Woe to you who work godlessness and glory and lying and extol them. Extol means to you, you edify them. You shall perish and no happy life shall be yours. Woe to them who pervert the words of uprightness and transgress the eternal law and transform themselves into what they were not into sinners, it says. They shall be trodden under foot upon the earth. Now I have to stop there real quick. Number two says, Woe unto them who pervert the words of uprightness. What does that mean? Woe unto them who pervert the words of unrightness. Up, up brightness. Let me tell you what that is. To pervert something is simply to change it to suit your needs. That's like taking scriptures to support your point of view, to make yourself right, to make your point right. Well, let me share this with you. If you have a point to make and it was born of the flesh, the flesh is full of unrighteousness because the wages, right? Your flesh you can only reap corruption by sowing into the flesh. And if you reap corruption, death is corruption. Isn't it? Death is decay and corruption. But we die to the flesh that we may live with Christ. Death being that old man you've gotten out of that body becoming the new creature. To pervert the words of uprightness is to support the flesh by way of scripture. Hope you understand that. In other words, I hear, you know, people do this a lot. They'll have a viewpoint in the world, and they go and grab scriptures to, to, to support their viewpoint. In other words, they take what is holy to support their plan. Not God's plan, theirs. See, in the scriptures, the plan is already revealed. And many people cannot use the scriptures in context because it speaks against their plan. It also speaks against the flesh. And so they take bits and pieces coming up with a new story. That is perversion. Woe unto them who pervert the words of uprightness and transgress the eternal law. What is the eternal law? God told us and Jesus told us all the time. What is God? God is love. God is love. True love. We work with the Lord in our lives. Outside of love, there is no Christ for you, nor do you know who God is. The eternal law is love itself is a portion of it. And you know what? Enoch goes into depth on this. And that can be demonstrated and shown in the Old Testament. And that's something. Because in love, the Ten Commandments was formed in the first place. And with love, the Ten Commandments can be kept. By love, Jesus was sent to all men. 
By love we can now enter into him and be cleansed of our sins. God commanded his love towards us, sending his only begotten son to us. Through love all these things were happening. Through love iniquity is undone. Your flesh is undone and life is granted through love and love alone. And again, God is love. To keep the eternal law is to praise the living God in truth, in spirit and in truth. Not your way, but the true way. Mm -mm. Let me give an example of worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth because that throws some people off. Let me give an example. If you didn't know what I did today, how could you ever thank me for something? You couldn't. You couldn't do it because you don't know what I did. Right? If you don't know what I did, nor do you know my character, nor do you know how I operate, there's no way you can lift me up in anything that's truthful. Is that correct? If I did nothing for you and that's all you know, you're not going to think about me. But if I saved your life five times and you just were made aware of it, you'd say, oh, thank you. For what? For doing this, that, and the other. Then you would realize, start to realize my character. See, we do that with the Lord, not in the fake way to be heard of men. But to worship him in spirit and in truth is not to worship him by way of flesh. But all of what you are is in constant reverence of him. To worship the Lord our God in spirit and in truth is to never stop worshiping. To live with a thankful heart. To live understanding he is before you always and he is above all things. It is to never slip and place anything above him to worship him in spirit and truth. To worship him in spirit and truth is not something you do for one hour. It's a lifestyle that you live. It's a lifestyle. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, even when you're dreaming. Oh, you don't think that's possible? Listen, I've had dreams and I still worship the Lord. The nature of my dreams have changed so much that I know their dreams. I know. And I just look around and say, Lord, what are you showing me? I know their dreams. I know what they are. But the Lord is my banner always. He is above all things, even in dreams. I don't care if anything spooky comes out. And you know what? When you stop, when you, when nothing, when you have no more fear in you, you'll stop having scary dreams. But he will show you a reality of things far more shaking than that. He will. I've had a few of those. I experienced iniquity pulled out. I experienced pride when you're walking with the power of the Holy Ghost. I experienced those things by way of dreams. I can assure you that's much more scarier than any monster. Why is it scary? Because the very thought of misusing what the Lord has bestowed upon you for his cause and you utilizing it for yourself, having any smile because you did something in the flesh is not giving him glory. When you actually become one of the people who truly knows you deserve no glory and you feel guilty, if anybody ever tried to give you glory because you say, oh no, that's God's glory, not mine. People can thank me all day. That does not make me smile, nor does it lift my heart. What Jesus did at the cross lifted my heart. And do you not know he is my Prince of Peace? Is he your Prince of Peace? Do you know what Prince of Peace is in the first place? I'll tell you what it is. Prince, that word implies noble power. He is the noble power of my peace. What is peace? That's a settling in the mind. Peace is not to worry. Peace is not to have anxiety. He is the source. He is the origin. He is the maintainer, the noble power of my peace. See, because if you worry, there is no noble power that grants you peace. Because you worry. A noble power is nevertheless a power. He is my prince of peace. Haven't you listened to the songs that we play on COT? Haven't you listened to the song, The Names of God, because of who you are, the names they use? 
the names that they're using is not God's name. They are attributes of him. By way of understanding, people of old learned his ways. These are his ways. Prince of Peace is an attribute of him. It's not a joke. It's not. Beautiful. It's beautiful. Woe to them that pervert the words of uprightness and transgress the eternal law. And trans, you know what? And also, during this day, people transgress the eternal law all the time. Eternal law is a law that never fades away, a law that will never change. It'll never change. Right? Never change. But in this day and age, people are, are working outside of that law and calling it something good. Mm. And they transform themselves into what they were not, into sinners. Now, this is the big one. Now, how does one transform themselves into what they were not? I'll tell you how. Some of you were born. Some of you were born, and you were marked to be isolated from all people, but in your heart you desired to be with someone. So that when you lost your virginity, you automatically felt guilty. You went in the world to try and justify, saying, well, everybody does it. You came up with every excuse in the world. But it felt like the power was drained out of your body at that time when you lost your virginity. Something changed within you. Your innocence was stolen, and you agreed to have that done, right? Now, some people did this to you. I can tell you right now, that doesn't count. Isn't that funny? See, if somebody came up to a person and, and just violated them, you still won't lose your innocence. If you willingly participate in it, you do lose your innocence. Isn't that something? See, you're the one that has to lose your innocence. Nobody can take that from you. The world tells you somebody can take that from you. That's a lie. That's a lie from Lucifer. That's what the world told you. That's not what God told you. You guys see that? It's not what God told you. The Lord did not tell you that. The devil told you that. I'll give you an example of this. Because this is a, I want you to understand this. When you tell yourself you can't accomplish something, who told you that? Who told you that? Did you tell yourself that? Did you come up with that all by yourself? When you say you can't accomplish something in the will of God, who told you that lie? That's the devil. He is a liar. He speaks against all those things Christ speaks. Innocence is of the soul. Um, nobody can touch your soul, right? The flesh does not sin apart from itself. If somebody, if somebody cuts me, is that going to make me unclean? No, it's not. If somebody chops off a limb, is that going to make me incomplete? No, it is not. If I am violated, am I unclean? No, I am not. I am not. But if I agree to enter into an act, I am unclean. If I agree to cut off my own leg, I am unclean. You see how that works? Innocence is of the soul. The flesh is just a carcass. I'm telling you the truth. The flesh is a carcass. And because the world edifies flesh, they judge you by the flesh. Jesus did not judge anything by the flesh. Jesus said, you judge by what you see. I judge no man. That's what Jesus said. He judges no man. So that big lie, some of you females and males, where you think you lost your innocence, that is based in a lie. No one violated your soul. No one. He lied to you from the beginning. To make you never fully receive love because the day you fully receive love is the day he's lost in your life and everybody else's life you live with. If you ever receive the fullness of love from the living God, you the ones who were violated when you were young, if you ever receive that love in full, Satan lost in everybody's lives connected to you. 
You will crack his skull from everybody's life. He will flee from the town you're in. Why do you think he attacked you in the beginning? Hmm? He tried to stop you from receiving the fullness of love. That's why. There's a misconception. See, when the flesh, the flesh itself a long time ago, before the mixture of the Nephilim and all this other weird stuff, the flesh was kept isolated for the sake of future generations. You've got to understand this. When Jesus came at that point, all flesh was corrupted. The flesh cannot enter into the kingdom of God. It has to die. Why? Because it's corrupted. When you're born, you're born into sin. Why? You're born into the flesh, which is sin. Your flesh has already been corrupted from your father's 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 father's. And your mother's 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 mother's. Too many mixing and everything else. You have genes from just about everybody. Your skin color and eye color, if you had a 50-gallon uh, uh, fish tank, your skin color and eye color represents one marble if it will fall to the top. You have every type of gene you could possibly think of. Oh, yeah, and all this test your DNA stuff, that's going to the Mormon vault. Oh, they're seducing people left and right. Yeah, go find out where you're from. I don't need to know where this flesh is from. I know my Lord and Savior. I know that I'm grafted into the branch. And that has nothing to do with DNA. See, everybody who's stuck on DNA are forgetting. That's for, that's for the world of flesh. But we're in this world, not of this world. If you're not of this world, you don't share in that DNA. That's your flesh. And if you've died to your flesh, your flesh is not ruling you. Christ is. See, I love that. Doesn't matter what color you are, what your hair color is. If you have a Nephilim, a big toe, so what? Jesus came to save the soul, not your flesh. In this day and age, most people are mixed with things you wouldn't possibly believe. And that's why the desires of the flesh are so strong. You didn't lose your innocence. That was of the flesh, and you are not your flesh. How pitiful a thought is that? How beguiling is that that people still think this way? Hmm? That's why I always tell you guys, so what if the flesh breaks down? Big deal, what does that have to do with me? If I get sick where I can barely make it, so what? What does that have to do with my soul? Nothing. Sickness has nothing to do with my soul. The way the body breaks down has nothing to do with my soul. Nothing. All those folks that are out there, you had tattoos and this, that, and the other. Before you were saved or when you were saved, right? You lost interest in the tattoos. I say, so what? So you got a tattoo, you're not your flesh, so what? So you got 15 piercings, big deal. So what? You're not your flesh. Jesus did not come to save your flesh. See, the, that's a lie from Lucifer. That's a beguilement that people still believe. Some people, the very premise of their language and teachings is to preserve the flesh. It is. The Pharisees used to do this to exercise power over people. They would say, well, your flesh is unclean. And that's why Jesus said, you're clean on the outside, but inside you're rotten. You're a brood of vipers. Their flesh was clean. But they were full of dead men's bones inside. They kept the flesh clean, set apart. But they were condemned and doomed inside. Jesus didn't come to save the flesh came to save the soul my goodness you see all the exposed this exposes a huge lie people walk around with their heads down and, oh I just messed up so bad look at all these piercings. I put horns in my head I know a guy who actually did that put horns in his head and he converted into a Christian he said is this going to condemn me I said, no, it's not, because you gave your heart to Jesus of Nazareth. And it, this is so funny. He said, well, what am I, how am I going to explain this? Because I can't have them removed. I said, well, then use it as your testimony. 
Let it be a demonstration of how far a person can go and Jesus can still save. Do you not know two years later his body absorbed those implants and they're not there anymore? But only after a lot of people saw him, heard his testimony. There have been cases of people who came to the Lord who have also split their tongue in two parts, and do you not know their tongue grew back together for the sake of speech? Hmm? In fact, that's a common story of many people who have cut their tongue in two and then came to the Lord. The first thing of repair is their tongue. I tell you, when you start speaking holy things, then all things of which is utilized for that holy thing must be repaired. People are always looking for healing, then become holy. As far as my body is concerned, it's committed to the things of my soul and my soul desires. Jesus of Nazareth and my Father in heaven, so it must conform. See, it will conform so long as I decide to walk in the will of the Lord. The Lord will sustain it, not me. He'll sustain it, not me. All I need to do is walk in his will. Anything in his will is sustained, period. Outside of his will, things are not sustained. So long as you have your plan, you're not operating by God's plan. So long as you have your path, you're not walking in the path set before you. So long as you're being careful to take the steps you want to take, your steps are not being ordered of the Lord. You guys see how that goes? See how that works? Now, I'm supposed to be going into the book of Enoch, right? I'm sorry, guys. I'm getting all off track. Are you kidding? <sighs> I thank the Lord for his understanding and his wisdom. It is so simple. All one has to do is step back from all things, silence their mind, and say, yes, Lord. He will pour out where you don't have room enough to contain, I'm telling you. And the most precious thing a person can ever receive is not gold or money, but wisdom. Wisdom. There have been times in my life where I just didn't have money to do anything, and I didn't ask for money. I said, Lord, give me the wisdom. I need understanding and wisdom so I can operate, not be in this position or not care about it or something. See, when I get worried about something, I understand the root cause of it. I need wisdom. See, wisdom is also having a sound mind. Insanity is worry. That's why I said God has not given us a spirit of fear. Right? And then it goes on that scripture, he said, but of a sound mind. So what does that tell you? To have a sound mind is to not be crazy. But the spirit of fear is craziness. So if you have that spirit of fear and worry, uh uh-oh, now you're hinging on the crazy part. I didn't say it. The scriptures do. You should laugh at that one. I did when I first found that out. I said, oh, my Lord, I'm worried. And the Lord is conveying to me, you're crazy. You're, you're a lunatic. He gave us a sound mind. And if the opposite of fear, right? If the opposite of fear is a sound mind, oh my goodness, that means you're nuts. You're crazy. You're crazy in God's eyes if you have fear. That spirit of fear is craziness. A lunatic, I say, oh no, now men can call you crazy. That's one thing. But for the Lord to say you're you're off your rocker, but that is something else, Lord. Okay, I quit that. Worry is no, and then I found out worry just wastes your time. Jesus said things about that too. He told Martha that. He conveyed that quite a few times. Why, why are you sitting there worrying? It didn't add anything to your life. It's a waste of time. In other words, he called it stupid. If, if Jesus called something a waste of time, Isn't that stupid? He gave us a sound mind. So here's the deal. When you try to figure out your own problems, absent the Lord, you are crazy. You're just as crazy as a fruitcake. But when you ask the Lord for understanding and wisdom, you become wise. 
See, if you do it yourself, he's not the head of your life in that area. He's not the banner in that area when you're doing things yourself. When you seek him out, you've made him first. We are to make the Lord first in all things, not some things, not just those things that are convenient, not the things just solely connected to church, but the head of all things. If the Lord is your banner, then he truly is the head of all things. If he's the prince of your peace, he is the reason, the power behind your peace, the noble power, the origin of your peace, not the other stuff. So when you worry, you have not included him. You're still trying to solve the problem. And you worry because your, your resolve failed. Yes, your resolve. You sought out people and not the Lord. And the Lord purposed that to fail every single time. And the way that works, if you seek out people and not the Lord, you're not making them first. So it's going to work to beguile you sometimes and then fall apart. Every single time. So you're crazy. Hmm. And we've all been there. Let's not act like, yep, they, those people shouldn't be crazy. No, we've all been there. All of us have been there. So we've all at one point been lunatics in the eye of the Father. We certainly have. Folks, I'm going to take a break real quick. I'm going to be right back. I'm going to play this song again. It's five minutes and 16 seconds. I'll be right back. It's me. That, that just... That just gets me all the time. Folks, I want to share something with you so we can get off this, uh, so we can close up the subject of worry and, and wise people. Let me give you an example of something real quick. Um, as an engineer, there have been plenty of times, uh, you know, you go through the academia and you get a doctorate and, and you have your engineering degrees and this, that, and the other. And you have a master's in computer science and you just keep going and going and going, right? And um, one day... But there was a habit I used to have, especially um, when I had to do paperwork or sit down and think about tactics and things of that nature uh, from logistics and everything else, you name it. And so one day it dawned on me, you know, because um, uh, people will edify you. Oh, you're so smart and so this, that and the other. No, I'm not the idiot. I'm an idiot. Let me tell you why. Because there were so many times that I would often say, well, you know, I, I don't have time for this or that because I'm so busy trying to figure this out. Now, I'm a Christian. But listen to what I'm saying. I used to tell people, no, I, I have too many things to figure out. I don't have time for that. That's, you know, that's child stuff. I don't have time for that. Because I have to figure this out. And I would struggle over the course of days over a simple problem, one problem, but I couldn't find the solution. Right? Certainly in engineering, everybody out there who has ever fooled with electronics or woodwork or something like that, and you need to find a solution. You've done the same thing. You've always had that one problem that had you stuck for days, right? All of a sudden, you go to sleep one day, and while you're sleeping, the answer comes to you in a dream. Hmm? And you go try it, and it works. Now, you never thought of this thing. It was revealed to you in a dream. All that time, you kicked everybody to the side, and you had one dream, and it fixed the entire problem. This is why I say I'm, I'm foolish. Because the entire time, I was trying to solve everything. Because I was empowered with the knowledge to do so, forgetting about the Lord. So I shoved aside his prized creation, not sharing of myself with them, because I deemed something above them. And so I was made the fool. After all the turmoil, after all the thought processes and the research, after all the testing, and all these other things, we're talking teams of people, the answer comes in a dream and I found out I'm looking in the wrong area in the first place. And it made me feel just flat out stupid. Just stupid. And it hit me. Lord, forgive me. I was so involved in trying to be right. I did not place you at the head of this circumstance. 
And he did truly make me a fool, but that day I became wise. Wisdom is not your ability to solve everything. Wisdom is being mindful of where the source of understanding comes from. To contemplate those things of the Lord is to have answers for everything you need in your life. Wisdom is utilizing the source. Wisdom is applying truth. That's what wisdom is. So then, the spirit of fear, that anxious feeling, that irritation, comes from an individual trying to solve their own problem shoving everything else to the side and they become fearful because it may not work maybe you have a deadline I've been there too hmm. the spirit of truth says trust in the Lord and do all of what you can and whatever you cannot do the Lord will do when you're in his will I've had so many revelations from a dreams there are certain answers in dreams that I have received and I learned more in about a split second than people have learned in half their lifetime. That's the revelation of the Lord. It's awesome. That day I stopped trusting in my academic qualifications, in my own dumb achievements. It also hit me. All the degrees one can ever have simply means you're a master of what mankind made. Well, what is that? What, what is that? How can one boast on that? Well, I know everything about what another man made. That's dumb. That would be like me saying I have a doctor's, I have a doctor's degree in coffee cups. You would laugh me out of everything, right? Because a coffee cup is man-made. And I know all about the coffee cup. How about that? That doesn't deem me smart to be an expert in what mankind made. That'd be the stupidest thing you've ever heard. To lift myself up because I have a doctor to, doctor's degree in coffee cups. Right? And I'm proud of it. And I post it all over the walls. Yes, I'm qualified to talk about coffee cups. You would look at me and say, oh boy, he's gone off the rocker. But this is what mankind does. They edify and lift up their flesh so much and have a confidence in this imaginative thing called the accomplishments of man, something mankind made, that they shove everything God created to the side. In other words, it empowers them to be a type of God, little g in the earth. That's something. And the Lord taught me, stop trusting in your own knowledge that comes from man and learn my ways. That was the most powerful message I could ever receive. That's why I speak of the kingdom so much in contrast to the world. I'm not here to perfect anything in the world but to learn of my Father's kingdom, to walk in that kingdom each and every day. To perfect my walk in the kingdom is to simply stay walking in the kingdom. And that's something. These simple things, they should be discussed. But then again, I have no restraints when I'm, you know, I have foot and mouth disease. So when you have no restraints, the Holy Spirit is not restrained. You don't resist him and it just pops out. I'm not trying to make a point to you. Right? See, in my eyes, if you hear, you hear, and if you don't, you don't. I love you anyway. But it's not my job to cause you to hear. But what I say, I say out of love. That you don't have to go through what I went through with. Okay, back to the book of Enoch, because I have to leave in about 15 minutes. It says, it says, those folks that transform themselves into what they were not, into sinners, they shall be trodden underfoot on the earth how can one transform themselves into a sinner by adopting those things of the world knowing that in the beginning they were set aside and some of you know that you know that you were set aside you were set aside from the beginning but you dabbled in the world seeking your own answers 
You were set aside from the beginning, and you know it. Your dabbling is much more severe than the average person's dabbling. Your dabbling causes you to be hooked. Of course, it failed and failed miserably. Even those of you who are trying to kick a habit right now, you will. Even those of you who are trying to, maybe you're trying to get off pain meds, you will. You will. You will. But see, we dabbled. We knew from the beginning. No one had to prove to us God was real, Jesus was real. We knew. We dodged it. But we didn't stay there, thank God. So guess what? We were not transformed into sinners, but into the new creature. See? It says, in those days, make ready, ye righteous, to raise your prayers as a memorial. Oh, you better hear this, guys. And place them as a testimony before the angels. That they may place the sin of the sinners for a memorial before the Most High. Then why is that in there? Listen, you need to understand this process. It says, in those days, make ready, ye righteous. Now, because you are the righteousness of Christ, this is speaking about those who truly do accept the Son of the living God as their personal Savior. To accept him as your personal Savior, to believe upon his name, is to know the story of his Christ. Thus, you are the righteousness of Christ in the earth. It says, prepare yourselves to raise your prayers as a memorial. And place them as a testimony before the angels. What is that? That is that your heart's petition was for all men and women. That you did not judge and you sought for them to be saved also as your father desires all flesh to be saved. Right? Your prayers were up there. You felt the oppression and everything else. This is not one of those prayers of you trying to get out of trouble. But this is your prayer on behalf of those who are sinning in the world. And you're petitioning for them. That will be raised as a memorial that they may that they may place the sin of the sinners for a memorial before the Most High. That means because they turned you down, the multiple calls from many people, when you petition for them in truth, your petitions, not so much what you said to them, your petitions, that's the truth of you. What you pray about is the truth of you. What you go into your secret place and cry and pray about when it concerns somebody else is the truth of you. It is not what you pray about for yourself. That's not the truth of you. It's everything you do for somebody else. That is the truth of you. That's going to be raised before the most time. The Lord will weigh all these things on his righteous balances. Listen, it says in those days, the nation shall be stirred up. And the families of the nations shall arise on the day of destruction. Do you know what's happening right now? So many of you. Oh, this gets me excited. So many of you. Over the course of the last five years. I say this through observation and through your conversations. So many of you, you. You began by talking, trying to force the word of God down people's throats. You don't do that anymore. Now you're just holding your hands tight saying, Lord, please just show them. And you're doing that out of love. See, when you truly love someone, you, you don't really speak to them. But you'll fall to your knees and petition for them. And your heart breaks for them. And you cry for them. Those are real prayers. No one saw you do that. That's real. What you do in view of men is not so much real. But what you do in your secret place. That no one knows about. That's presented to the Lord. And what you've been doing. What you've been doing is making ready. You're raising those prayers as a memorial. You are. You are. It's what you're doing. And guess what's happening now? The nations are being stirred up. It says, in those days, in what days? The days that your prayers are about to be presented to the Most High. In those days, the nations shall be stirred up. They're stirring up now. And the families of the nations shall arise on the day of destruction. And see, folks, do you understand what this is saying? My goodness, this is like a line-by-line -line transcript 
of what's been happening. Even in our own lives. Hmm? Ah, can you guys see that? And in those days, the destitute shall go forth and carry off their children. They shall abandon them so that their children shall perish through them. Do you know what that is? The children will perish through them. Then it says, yea, or that means yes, they shall abandon their children that are still sucklings and not return to them and shall have no pity on their beloved ones. What is that? Let me tell you something. Fifty years ago, abortion was not very popular, was it? Hmm? It wasn't popular. A suckling is a very young child. A suckling is a term used for both an unborn baby and a baby that's just born. To abandon their children is abortion. Now, anybody who's out there who has had an abortion, you better thank God for your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because I'm sure you repented and the Lord has truly forgiven you. He's forgiven you. Okay? Don't condemn yourselves. If you have done that, I'm telling you right now, you came to the Lord, the Lord has forgiven you. He is forgiving you. There is no sin you can commit that the Lord will not forgive you of, but blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. You cannot be forgiven of that, okay? You can't. Anything else you blaspheme, you can be forgiven of. And if you have truly repented, you have been. But people are abandoning their children. And listen, it says, yes, they shall abandon their children that are still sucklings and not return to them. That means after the abortion, they take no thought of the child that was aborted. They don't understand, and it says they shall have no pity on their loved ones. The child, when it's, when it's conceived like that, is appointed to that family, right? A decision was made. Because all children are purposed, and so they are to be in that family, right? So it was purpose, and they destroy that purpose, and they abandon them because they take no thought of the child they aborted. Nor do they know them. They totally abandon them in heart and in mind and everything else. Do you guys see that? And now abortion is legal. There is no, I'm, I'm going to tell you guys something. You may not agree with me. You may not agree with me. There's no way in the world. If I was in charge, abortion would be legal. It would not be legal. It wouldn't be. Here's what I believe. I believe each and every individual has their own choices to make. That's what I believe. I don't even believe abortion should be part of the law in the first place. I, I really don't. Because each and every individual has their choice to make. That shouldn't be part, that shouldn't be part of the law, period. That shouldn't even be in the law books. But it would be looked down upon by communities of the righteous. And it is the righteous that are responsible of the morality of the nation, not the law. People can obey the laws and be a brood of vipers. Satan is a stickler for laws. He can follow the rules, so do demons. The law is not going to make someone moral. But the righteous can in a land, because they can uphold morality, be an example, a perpetual example. See, when the examples of morality are gone, so is the priesthood, because that is your priesthood. You're supposed to be an example of morality. And when somebody does something like that, have an abortion, you know Jesus forgives. They need counseling, don't they? As they get counseling, they will advise others, hey, don't do that. The Lord will make a way, and you won't have to abort that child. You guys see how that works? But everything is crooked and crooked, and man is calling it good. Do you all see that? You see how important the church is? Do you see that morals have dropped down to zero? Why? Because the examples of morality 
have been effectively stifled in the world. That's why. You see how that works? What an easy solution, huh? But they don't want to do anything that would defame their power. See, they see it as power. It's power to them. Anywhere they can get power, they want it. They can't help it. That is one of the lusts of the flesh. And a lust is an unquenchable thirst. An unquenchable thirst of the flesh is to have power over somebody else. Right? And it's happening already. What I'm telling you is that these things are happening already. Your prayers are being presented. Because now you're really praying. You're going to your secret place and you're crying for people and they don't even know you're praying for them. You're not making it known to them that you're praying for them. That's how I know it's a true prayer and the Father does too. It's coming from the heart. Because you're spilling out your heart on behalf of them and they don't even know it. That's a real prayer. That is a real prayer. That's the prayer that will be presented. Oh, that's a real prayer. When your heart breaks and tears fall and you're petitioning to the Father, Lord, let them see that they may find Christ. That is a real prayer. All this other fancy stuff when people say, Oh, thou art. No, that's King James English. What are you saying that for? God doesn't speak that way with the thousand these. That's you trying to imitate the King James Version of the Bible. That's old English. That's what that is. You don't talk like that. A thou and a thee. Is that how you talk to everybody else? But see, when you get on your knees and you petition for somebody else, you can hardly speak anything. You'll just simply say, Lord, please just help them. And the Lord knows your heart is crying out, and you can't put the words what's in your heart. Your tears and your cries are interrupting your words. That's a real prayer. That's coming from an internal source of truth. Not the facade of sounding eloquent. Your heart cries out and you don't have the words. Your heart breaks. And there is no explaining it. And you truly begin to look to the Lord and look to the Lord alone because you know nobody else can help it. You know at that moment without him is a lost cause. That's why you're in your secret place. That's when you recognize the most high. When you learn to look at life and say, if my father does not do it, it is a lost cause. Then you truly stand in your lot within Christ and in the kingdom. And that's what you're doing. And those prayers are being presented. And when you know it at the same time, the nations are being stirred up. You're going to tell me, listen, those things that the Lord has revealed to his servants, the prophets, that he has revealed to his servants and special ones that have been throughout time, he absolutely means every word he says. And it's absolutely 100% coming to pass. And it will not return void. Because God watches over his word to perform it. I tell you this too. If you're full of his word. His word not yours. He's going to watch over you to perform what you say. Because you'll speak nothing of yourself anymore. And you'll only speak those things he gives you to say. That same power Jesus had. Is granted to you. But the Lord watches over his word to perform it. And Jesus said, I never speak anything of myself. I only say those things the Father gives me to say. God performs his word, not anybody else's. And when you become a true vessel for his word, that only his word comes out of your mouth when he says to say it, he will perform every word that leaves your mouth. My goodness, now you're walking with power and in obedience and in the kingdom and uprightly and you have completion and fulfillment there is no loneliness emptiness there is no worry there is only the father hmm. these simple things we can get hold of them the Lord granted us to be those individuals 
so then be those individuals. Lay down your life before him. Take up your cross and bear it. Lay down your life for him and take up your cross and bear it. Lay down your plans and follow Christ. Stop trying to take your own way in life and simply follow Jesus of Nazareth. He said so many times, come, follow me. He said so many times, I will show you where the fountain of living waters are. He told us so many times, he will give us true things to eat. Lay down your life before him. Take up your cross and follow him and find what you've been looking for. Redemption is yours. The victory is established. All your treasures are in the eternal kingdom. Don't look for them here. Lay down your life and take up your cross. Become what you're destined to be. He did predestinate you. And all you have to do is walk into it. That's that's a choice and an act of obedience to continue in that choice you made. Let him strengthen you in truth. I think we've had enough phony strength within ourselves that always seems to fail. Operate by the strength of the Lord by laying down your life and truly saying, Father, my life is now yours. I have no life. Outside of you, Father. And stop seeking your own things. And seek ye. You seek the kingdom of God. And all of his righteousness. Lay down your life. Lay down your plans in your way. Have liberty. The sun will truly set you free. And you will truly be free indeed. Be fulfilled. Because this is the hour. Folks, I'm going to say I love you. Pastor Paul will be starting in about 15 minutes. I've got to run. I've got to run. What a talk, huh? We're going to have to do this again. We will do it next Friday, but um, I'm getting the audio systems back up and running. We're going to have more of these talks. Something about the early hours that's just very different, very lively. Very lively. God bless each and every one of you. I'll see you all this evening. Also, remember, Pastor Scott starts at 3 p.m. today for praise and worship, all the way up until the time that I start yapping. And God bless you, Pastor Scott, for continuing to lead us in praise and worship every single day, but in those days that you can do so. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. But let us get in. I, I tell you guys what, let's have a real praise and worship session in there today. Let's keep in our minds to lay down our lives and to take up our cross and bear it and truly follow the Lord. Let that be our theme of today. God bless each and every one of you.